Valerie Salomasson and uh, represented to my colleague uh, Maris Manista Astani, uh, the third author on the CBAC, unfortunately couldn't uh, join the conference and our study is on end of theory in the area of big data and the analysis of pedagogical practices and challenges in the social media studies. So the starting point of our study are the discussions in the field of the critical data studies about the social technical outcomes of the data term within the discipline of social sciences. The new emerging data sources like social media enable finding answers to the unanswered research questions, understand and explain the social processes. However, uh, these new emerging data um, sources also challenge the methods and methodologies with the social sciences and therefore several issues at the end of theory or descriptive empirism have been ascribed to new emerging data sources and native methods. Therefore, uh, on the other hand, there is lack of empirical studies analyzing how these methodological changes are expressed in practice in the field of social media big data studies and this is focus of our presentation where we would like to fill this gap and analyze it empirically. So uh, theoretically, big data could be seen as an ambivalent phenomenon. But in our study, we don't uh, focus so much on the, the quantitative features of big data, like uh, the, the size of the data, but we see big data rather as a shift from design to the organic data or as a social technical pheno phenomenon. So we assume that the, the measurements of big data may change the ways and how the knowledge is produced within the social sciences. On the one hand, the big data may offer certain alternatives to the traditional methods. So for example, several issues have been ascribed to traditional social, sociological methods like moderate response rates of service or non-representativeness of both service. On the other hand, Within social sciences, very often the computational uh, methods and techniques have been taken over from the computer sciences, for example. And therefore, the social sciences are very often criticized. Uh, for example, um, it, is said, it is said that it's, uh, uh, social sciences are moving towards end of theory for descriptive empirism meaning that very often due to the computational techniques, the analysis focuses only on the correlations without being able to understand the social phenomena and explaining the underlying mechanisms of different issues and phenomena. Another part of the discussion is some focus on the challenges. So in order to be better, uh, better enable finding the answers to the uh, research questions, Therefore, it also these new data sources challenge the formal methods and methodologies. However, the studies have shown that the most of the innovations have been in the field of um, data analysis techniques and methods, and that therefore for being enabled for um, answering this criticism and new methodologies that should be uh, developed. There is a lot of discussions within the social sciences about the a lot of criticism to social sciences. So, for example, studies of Francis Bacon, Wright, Wright Mills, or Max Weber, or other authors. So, these discussions is, are nothing, nothing new. Uh, how, what are the, the best methods within the social sciences, for example? But within the big data, uh, there are, are two main discussions uh, emerging uh, in this uh, in this uh, context. So, for example, one uh, uh, discussion focuses on the crisis of measurements. So, for example in the context of comparative and social studies and other group of discussions focus on what kind of methods should be used in the context of the big data. Traditional statistical methods on the one hand or algorithmic or hand machine learning approaches on the other hand. So these discussions initially focused on the notions like end of theory or what's theoretical age, but later the more nuanced arguments have been emerging. So for example, pessimists have said that within social sciences, most of the computational methods have been taken over. And on the other hand, the optimists have said that computational methods itself would be both inductive or deductive, or even enabling certain inductive leap, meaning that the computational methods may offer 
new theoretical approaches or challenge the former theories, for example, in the field of internet studies. And uh, the discussions also focus on permanent search for the third way. So for example, the, the recent uh, article that was published in, in Science uh, by Hoffman and his colleagues uh, have been focused uh, on, uh, on describing different uh, techniques uh, or methods uh, how to explain the interpretable causal mechanisms uh, in, in, in the social sciences. But uh, although there's a lot of discussions uh, about this uh, methodological shift uh, within social sciences, there are only single studies examining and verifying the methodological uh, shifts. Uh, and the studies have been related to emergence of big data, like data collection methods and uh, related challenges, but not on the method methods. So in our studies, study we are focusing, we focus on one kind of big data, we focus on social media data, and we would like to, to study if these shifts would be also seen in the empirical, empirical studies. And based on these um, theoretical, theoretical discussions, we have formulated two uh, hypotheses. So on one hand, we would like to, to study the methods that are used, uh, the way of uh, the inferences that are made, and on the other hand, uh, the, the way how the, the team synthesis their teams uh, work together in making differences. So we assume that traditional methods somehow combine with computational techniques in social media studies rather than being replaced by those facilitating sort of traditional forms of interpretation and theory building. And we also assume that the proportion of the data driven theory building approaches are increasing in time compared to descriptive empirist research. And then, on the other hand, we assume that methodological innovations are more common in studies are conducted in transdisciplinary teams compared to the individual conducted studies within single discipline and therefore supporting the methodological innovations and theory driven research. And so we can go on to the data and method. We use systematic literature review method, empirical. Uh, uh, articles using social media big data as main source in the research. And uh, sample was uh, 442 uh, uh, articles, which we finally analyzed. Originally, we had uh, about uh, 483 articles, but uh, from those, uh, about the sorry uh, about uh, 100 uh, and a little bit more were theoretical. Some of them uh, had empirical research, but it wasn't related to big data or social media data. Also, there were some articles uh, which can be categorized as uh, popular scientific uh, articles. And also we had the category author. In that category we had uh, editorials, uh, commentaries, uh, bibliographies, which also came out uh, with the research. So we used semi structured coding schema, uh, where we had uh, quantitatively codable categories, then, and uh, <coughs> qualitative open codable methodology methodological limits as indicated by authors themselves. Uh, we used a close reading of the full text of each publication. Codes uh, reflect the identifiable formal information or reflect the level of precision presented by publication authors. And uh, we used the uh, software named Moskuda. Uh, for the quantitative uh, analysis, we used uni and mu techniques and uh, qualitative analysis uh, of thematic variation in, uh, between the goals. So now a little about results, but uh, keep in mind it's a work in progress. So there's much more interesting coming in some later time. So as I said, there were uh, 142 articles, and as you can see, see from this uh, graph, the social media and big data 
articles uh, are growing in the recent years. So uh, if you look at it, uh, there's uh, just uh, 38 articles in the 2015 and uh, 81 in 2016. Uh, a little bit about uh, data structuration. Here you can see that uh, most of the data was uh, unstructured or semi-structured. And there are some articles where uh, can was seen that the authors used also data diffusion. This means they had uh, several different uh, data sources and they needed to put it in the one uh, database or use it together not uh, And uh, about access, there were a lot of uh, or many studies using uh, data which was in billions or even billions, but there are also studies which used uh, like five interviews or they had uh, two, 2,000 and 700, uh, the, don't remember, but doesn't matter. Uh, also, there were uh, uh, 730 geocaches, uh, 72 uh, hazard-related uh, keywords. So uh, what we can also see that the size of data is not always uh, uh, said to be like uh, in uh, billions or in that kind of number, sometimes uh, it can be said in kilometers, uh, geocaches, uh, or other ways. Also, which is, which does maybe not so much surprise you, but the most relevant data source is Twitter. Over half of the studies uh, have used Twitter. Uh, there were that is using also Facebook, online service, or Flickr, but not so many as Twitter. And I think most of you know why is the Twitter mostly used data source here. Yeah. Uh, what is also interesting about the data sources is uh, that uh, there were one study about the uh, BrightKite. Maybe you know about this portal. This was close 2012, but the study itself was published 2014. This means that uh, nobody else can do, do that study anymore. And also we have one study which used uh, uh, one dating portal and uh, named uh, within the article as Mon Cherie, but we actually doesn't know uh, which portal it is. Why? because otherwise uh, they wouldn't have the possibility to conduct their research. Because the company who, is, uh, who has the data wouldn't let them do it. So this is also very interesting. And uh, which is also uh, important is that studies using more than one social media data sources are increasing uh, in the later years. There, there have been several studies using like uh, Twitter, Flickr, YouTube together, Twitter uh, questionnaires together, Twitter something else together. So I think this is also something that we can see and uh, which can be related with uh, different factors. Like uh, we have people from dis different disciplines working together. So we have maybe skills, tools, uh, and uh, opportunities to do it. And a little bit about the disciplinary background. So what I studies showed, there were uh, in all 338 authors. And uh, if you look at it, uh, 72 of them are with computer sciences background. Also, authors uh, with media and communication sciences background are also presented quite well. What is also important here is that uh, in eight places, 
uh, in articles uh, in themes there were consultants uh, outside of university. Mostly those consultants uh, worked in some kind of data science company. Uh, there was some uh, Korean company, IMC, if I'm not wrong, but then uh, McKinsey and Company, for example. A uh, little, little bit about the relatedness to the theory. So as you can see here, our results so show that the, that the theory is uh, uh, rather weakly related uh, than uh, strongly, and the relatedness have uh, grown in time. There are some disciplinary differences. Uh, stronger relatedness in medium communication studies weaker in computer sciences. Also, a little about the formulation of research programs. What is here very interesting is that uh, in most of the studies there weren't uh, any hypothesis or research questions. Uh, instead of that, there, there were uh, general aims or assumptions formulated. In some cases, this is 13 articles, uh, both research questions and hypothesis were formulated. And uh, we can say that there are some disciplinary differences. Uh, uh, research questions were more common in media communication studies, and so on. Little bit about methods used. Uh, this is uh, also very interesting that uh, in time the exploratory and explanatory predictive studies are uh, growing. And, uh, and uh, which is also interesting is that uh, authors self-express that their studies are either exploratory or explanatory in, in regarding that type of inter inference. Uh, about the techniques, uh, we can say that uh, various methods are quite equally used. Uh, it's uh, quite prevalent that we have to look up the other, uh, which is under that. Uh, computational techniques, uh, social media analytics are more used in the interdisciplinary teams, descriptive techniques in unidisciplinary articles, and there are some temporal differences, uh, chrome variety, less computational methods. And uh, briefly about methodological innovations, we have uh, six scopes. Uh, we can say that most of the methodological innovations are related to methodology, content related or method, but there are some innovations related also to tool or data source. If we are talking about tool, then uh, uh, some of those uh, innovations are related uh, with the fact that the team had uh, outside consultant. So they had somebody who had to make the tool or had opportunity to use some new tool. And uh, there's no statistically significant differences in methodological innovations reflected across years and disciplines and more innovations indicated in interdisciplinary theories. So, so the basic this initial results, so we can say that this uh, ancient theory hypothesis that we raised initially was only partially uh, confirmed, meaning that problem setting was rather weakly related to the theory, often no hypothesis or research questions were formulated that based so on the theory, at least in this social, social media big data studies. Uh, However, the this uh, initial results showed that the um, relative weak relatedness to the theory has not weak to the descriptive type of inference, but rather exploratory or explanatory predictive ways of uh, reasoning. And then the study also shows that there is a certain temporal decrease of descriptive ways of inference uh, based on the expressions of the authors uh, themselves. Uh, 
and certain increased relatedness to the theory. And the study also showed that there is quite high variety of analysis methods, including both statistical computation, content analysis, and, and other, other te techniques, as we can say that one, one part of the techniques, the like computation techniques, are uh, dominant. And although methodological innovations are not common in studies conducted in transdisciplinary teams, <coughs> There still are certain disciplinary differences and evidence. So, for example, relatedness to the theory uh, was rather expressed in the case of media communication uh, research or descriptive methods uh, were less used, uh, less used in uh, media communication studies and more used, uh, um, and computational techniques more used in trans transdisciplinary teams. So, um, this study is not. Uh, but, uh, without limitations, and so uh, social media is uh, just one possible source of big data that we have analyzed the different structure of the data, like textual data, geographical location, could determine the methods that are used in the analysis and the character of the novelty that is uh, reflected in the, in the studies. And also this um, certain disciplinary homogeneity would uh, determine also the methodological focus, so for example, this um, interpretative approach uh, expressed in media communication studies. Therefore, our further study uh, fo uh, should focus uh, on uh, analyzing more in detail to qualitative ana analyze the methodological reflections that uh, authors have expressed uh, for understanding the methodological uh, choices in the studies. And also, the further study for important the focus engaging into analysis also data across other data sources, and methods, and disciplines. So, thank you very much. Um, yeah, currently I'm, I'm working at the School of Governance at the Department of Professorship, which is called Professorship of Computation, Social Science, and Big Data at the Technical University of Munich. But originally, I come from STS, and uh, I'm also associated with the STS department of the University of Vienna. And uh, I basically, my, it's quite interesting because I can now I ended up where I actually didn't want to end up when I started to study sociology because originally I, I, I studied physics. And then when I decided to study sociology, I kind of discovered quantitative methods in the social sciences, and I was shocked, you know, coming from physics. I was shocked how the social sciences use quantitative methods. And, uh, and I immediately totally switched to qualitative social research, and I was totally happy for a long time in doing that. But uh, somehow, you know, as things are, especially since my focus is on studying social scientific methodology and practices, you end up with doing exactly what was the biggest problem some years ago uh, in the like, you know, psychological thing happening to us scholars probably. You always end up where you wanted to leave actually. But uh, so, so there I work and my role there is, is a very luxurious one. I'm, I, I don't have to be a data scientist to work there. I don't have to be a political scientist to work there even though we are linked to the political sciences. I can be an STS person that is actually criticizing the whole time the work my colleagues are doing, which is a great position, I have to say, and I, I, I like it very much. So this is just as an introduction that you know uh, where, from which position I, I speak today. Uh, uh, the, the last presentation was just a perfect introduction to what I'm going to talk about now. I want to talk about big social data. And uh, social data in general, one can say, have become a prominent commodity in the realms of ubiquitous datafication. And uh, big social data promise a lot, you know? Big social data promise the convergence of the macro, meso, micro dimensions, and uh, they, they, they should allow for new perspectives, encompassing both generalization and granularity uh, through mixed methods to approach public discourse. I'm sure you came across all those buzzwording in, in the articles that you read. Um, social, big social data promise to hold the understanding of the dynamics of large-scale structure and the communicating individual, which is actually uh, also what, what they should. Uh, and it, what, it, what they also promise us, and I think what is really important, they, they can promise us to do all that right there in our everyday experiences. Uh, and that is also the reason uh, uh, 
well, that is all, all also derived from the fact that uh, we use uh, when we talk about social media data and big social data, we mainly talk about data from one or two or three different uh, providers. So with big social data, we are hoping uh, to collect data that is not only broad but also deep, from micro level to macro accumulations. I can go on like this forever. But uh, so where do we find this data? Social media, first and foremost. Uh, because of the real-time nature, which is today very important in our accelerated uh, world, real-time, everything has to be real-time, and uh, because of the easiness of data collection, we find it uh, in some platforms that make, that kind of give us this access. And that is, as you have already prominently shown uh, most of the time, Twitter. I think it was 78 studies or yeah. something like that. Yeah, that is not uh, surprising. Uh, uh, why do we look at uh, social media data? We hope for uh, becoming some descriptive or predictive uh, uh, analytics uh, on human behavior, but we also want to influence human decision making. We want to uh, uh, kind of engineer social change on, uh, based on uh, what we learn from this social data. And uh, this can be micro-targeting in some uh, advertising companies or election campaigns, but this can also be something else, like data activists, um, uh, what well, data activists talk about. But this can also, of course, be some heavy surveillance systems. So anyway, in, in each case, no matter what the purpose is, we are looking at specific data markets. Because most of the social data that we have at our fingertips in real time today is uh, provided by some players in that market. So <clears throat> I, <laughs> I decided to make a screenshot of a book uh, that is very influential from Victor Meyer Schoenberger and uh, I don't know the first name, Kalkia, uh, that was called Big Data. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. It is like the Bible to a lot of politicians. It's a very anecdotal way. The authors write about the, the promises and less the perils of big data. And uh, the, the, the thing that struck me when I read it for the first time was that they really uh, very prominently and repeatedly say that now is the time, not only the end of theory, but now we have this everything at our fingertips. We have this N equals all, this empiricist vision of big data. It's there. Um, and the problem is why I call it a specter, uh, referring, of course, to the uh, manifesto of, uh, of Marx and Engels. Uh, I, I, I see it as a specter that is haunting the social sciences. The problem is just that the powers seem to have entered into a holy alliance to embrace it and not so much to exercise it. And why am I quoting this book? Uh, I, I work a lot as a policy consultant. And so I meet all these politicians that have no idea about big data except from this book. So a lot of them have read this and they believe it. And they really think that those visions are, are there yet. Actually, they think we are there yet. And this thinking adds to the end of theory uh, perspective. And it shows again how people tend to forget that method and data is full of theory and politics. It is raising some expectations in a very totalitarian imagination of godlike, to quote Donna Haraway, uh, and full insight and total enlightenment. And this is when you read this book carefully, it's it's giving you this imaginary. It's really a very that's also coming from a feminist standpoint, very typical uh, masculine uh, idea of of entirety, of totality, totalitarian. And uh, the expectations of big data come with this widespread belief, I'm quoting now uh, uh, Boyd, uh, that large data sets offer a higher form of intelligence and knowledge that can, can generate insights that were previously impossible. So we are definitely haunted by the empiricist dream of completeness. And uh, in daily research routines, uh, things look very, very different. I don't know how many of you are actually data scientists or are crunching big data sets, uh, uh, you, you might uh, know from your own practices that we are rarely working with n equals all. And basically, I've never worked with n equals all. Uh, and we are not even working on entire populations. So 
most of the, those uh, supposedly super smart, fast, cheap predictive techniques that we have today and profiling approaches in the world of big social data that say that they are there for decision making, support, and optimization of resource allocation, whatever, they are also not using any equal stuff. They are relying on access to samples of social media data as we do exactly the same situation. So, you, you remember this, I, I, I also took this uh, quote, the, the horse whip. So I, I tried to make a little collage and put the horse whip <laughs> in there. Because yeah, actually that's what we have. We have a horse whip. And uh, I want to put the horse whip a bit on the authors uh, that I was just quoting before. So big data does not entail working with full data sets, especially not in social science. I mean, there are cases of big data research where it's different, uh, where there is a different type of data in, that is very structured in its in a way collection and that has, been, uh, has a long tradition of a lot of stakeholders working with it. That is different uh, realities, but in social science, we don't do that. And even if this is like a wet dream of some, I don't know, journalists or legal experts, uh, legal scientists actually, that Victor Mayer-Schoenberg comes from law, uh, this is like the wet dream of data science and uh, those uh, idea of predictions of the end of theory. We are not uh, uh, doing what they think we are doing. We are sampling. All of the time we are sampling. Sampling it is we are doing, and many times we have to trust even others to get the sample. We cannot construct the samples on our own. So precisely because sampling is so prevalent, we should question it more often. I would love to see how many uh, uh, people wrote about their sampling method, because actually we did a little liter literature research for our project, and I found basically nearly none. Uh, let's say I found some mentions of the sampling method, but they were so generic and so superficial that we wouldn't any, find anything, or they were just replicating what Twitter says on the website. Uh, so I would, maybe you can have a look for me in your data group, just the you know, word sampling. I would, I would really fancy that. So I think we need to look closely at the methodology inherent to big social data studies because they are co-shaped with social realities by making sense of society, which is also a form of inscribing into society with norms, values, expectations. And they do so because a lot of decision makers and policy makers believe in that stuff that some of the social media analytics people, not always scholars, but also consultants, present to them. So I'm, I'm basing what I'm talking to, to you about today in this uh, tradition of research, social studies of social science and social technologies. Social technologies is an interesting term because it has two sides. Now we know it from social media, basically sometimes social media is also called social technology, but it has a very long uh, uh, tradition, this term. It goes back to, to the, the beginning of the 20th century when social scientists were thinking about social engineering and how to bring the social scientific method into tools to kind of uh, reshape society. And if you think how, for example, Facebook started, it, it started when a bunch, I mean, now I'm also becoming anecdotal, but when a bunch of guys, after having uh, been in their social network analysis class, number two or whatever, thought about how they could kind of make this platform that would kind of bring this uh, social scientific relational perspective into a tool. So you can see that is another very, very interesting point that is, uh, that is uh, for me, one of the most uh, interesting ones when I'm studying the, the impact of social sciences on society is that social sciences are most of the time diffusing very quietly into our social realms. They are, they are there, but they are not labeled as scientific, not as in other sciences where they have immediately this difference to our everyday experiences and you could see, ah, oh, that comes from science, that comes from medicine, that comes from physics, whatever. So the work of all those people and many more, of course, uh, tell us, for example, about the way in which statisticians and their collaborators make things knowable, like features of statistical practice. Uh, also, statisticians themselves have addressed, of course, uh, doesn't need always the SDS or historians of science crowd. Of course, those people think themselves and reflect uh, what they are doing and also sometimes very critical. And then, of course, it, it comes up to what is, what is there now, like critical data and algorithm studies that pave the way for a broader uptake of those issues. And I think it's high time to do this again. 
So this is also what we are trying to establish there at the professorship in Munich, uh, that we, we want to think in line with the idea of responsible research. So we think we need to reflect not only the scientific integrity, but also the plausibility and furthermore the social impact of our research practices. So as we have learned from many really known scholars here, uh, social scientific theory and methodology can have uh, quite a big impact and often this impact is co-created by the subject and objects of understudy. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, even when it comes, uh, and when it becomes a technology, as I said. So there is a lot uh, that we can draw from, uh, also historically. and. Uh, that was also important for us because we did this study that I wanted to present today originally, but I cannot present our study because it's under review at the moment. And I thought when, when I wrote, uh, when I kind of answered the call for this conference, I thought, ah, in June the review process will be finished so I can present our empirical study. Unfortunately, I cannot, but I'll kind of now start to give you a bit of insights what we did because it was actually quite alarming, the outcome. Uh, so, but for, for this study, this is like the frame uh, and uh, this is like the, the tradition that we that we build on. Uh, uh, and also, maybe uh, you are also familiar with this type of studies called infrastructure stu studies, like jo Geoffrey Boker, Susie D. Starr have, have been part of this as well, where, or platform uh, studies, uh, studies that study platform effects, because actually we found out that we have to draw much more attention towards the material technical conditions of platforms, especially when, when, it's, when it comes to uh, them being used as social scientific instruments. And uh, so we have to uh, pay much more attention to the performative and preformative capacities of platform protocols and infrastructures, which we did in the project that I'm going briefly to introduce. So uh, basically, uh, we, today I want to speak about sampling. That uh, seems to be a rather boring uh, issue for many people in the social sciences, or sometimes also in the in data science. But it is a very important process. And uh, even though uh, those authors, before they didn't believe we we have it, uh, it's, it's still there, and it brings us uh, it brings us the data we work for, uh, we work with in the analysis. So. I cannot go into details of the sampling methodology, but however, I want to emphasize two important things. The idea of a population related to the idea of representativeness and the idea of randomness. The most important part of the scientific inquiry in that sense is a focus problem definition that always comes with the definition of a population from which our sample can be drawn. Uh, first problem, of course, with social media is that you have hard times in defining the population. On, I mean, even, this is not the thinking already about different local configurations of, of the populations or different regional uh, demographics of, of users of Twitter, for example. It's basically that is already the first problem. What what is the population, and how can we? How can we work with this? So we know about all these uh, different demographics already, but if you look at the studies, you will find out that it's not, not so much effort goes into this, in this continuous description of the demographic of social media users. Not, not from the companies themselves, but also not from the research side. Uh, so a population can be defined as including all people, items, or events with the characteristic one wishes to understand. And sampling then, means taking a subset of this population to study it. This subset is then used to draw inferences about the larger data set, which is either not available in its entirety, normal situation with big data, or simply too big to be measured, part of problem with big data. Social scientific sampling is therefore more than just a mere reduction of data, as some people still see it. It is, it ha it, it is the place where theory and method meet. So this is or not the only one, there's several places in the research world, but this is a very important place because it's defining what data we will have and what stories we will be able to tell. And in sampling individual data points do not matter so much, but the relations that can be created between them and the entire population. And random samples can be interpreted very well in regard to the relation between sample and full data set. 
But sampling techniques based on non-probability do not always give uh, all data points the, the same uh, uh, chance of being selected, and so you have to deal very differently with how you interpret what you get out of it. So you see already there is a big, big difference. And if you want to relate to Twitter data, Twitter says you get a random sample. Uh, and we will, I will talk about how this is not the case, unfortunately. In terms of representativeness, it is very important to carefully define the sampling approach beforehand as it will determine the data and the stories to tell. I said that already. However, uh, yeah, I'm going to, going to tell you, show you how this is not possible. So here we, there are several studies, but also not a lot, that kind of look into uh, those really methodological problems. I mean, there have been tons of studies that look into the bias coming from demographics. But not so many studies have been looking into the bias coming from methods. So there are just three. That, uh, that the first is more like an overview article, but the other two, they're really looking into particular forms of methodological bias that is linked to the data access that we have. And uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the problem is sometimes I come from qualitative social science, and of course we, we are trained in the, the deconstructing ideas of bias and da da da. But sometimes we're talking with a lot of computer scientists or data scientists. There is this this other idea of bias, as if there was this platonic ideal world out there where you could actually do something without bias. And I always say, but what what is that? I mean that bias is our business. We are social scientists. I mean this is exactly what we want to study. <laughs> and so maybe we should think differently about bias. But that's another thought. So. Basically, today most data analytics uh, rely on these uh, randomly sampled tweets. Uh, this is a quote from the Twitter website. And the type of access the API offers uh, to the underlying database of Twitter is changing all the time. And it's very hard to follow it. And it's, it's very black box. And it's becoming increasingly more restrictive. And this will go on. And maybe our little study will also add to that. Uh, uh, Twitter has at the moment two models, uh, no, three actually, but one is just not it's so costly that nobody can afford it, which is access to the full data set, the firehose. But then it sells uh, a 10% randomly sampled tweet access. This is called the garden hose uh, for a fee. And then the 1% randomly sampled tweets uh, they give us for free. And random sampling is appealing for data analytics as the sample tweets preserve the statistical properties of the global set of tweets. So that is important, uh, given the idea of representative. So most of the studies kind of say that, OK, we use this random sample and we are fine. However, uh, some studies have already shown that this randomness is not really preserved. And they, but they still call it semi-random, but they are not sure what it is. So what we do is, we kind of uh, re-engineered, or uh, kind of uh, from re-engineered from the back again this uh, sampling uh, situation with a specific API, the one that should give access to not not the streaming one, but the it's called sample API now. It was called I think search API before, or I'm mixing it up already because it's it's, it's they're renaming it all the time, and. Uh, we, we could tamper with the sample in our study. We could manipulate the sample. We could uh, make tweets appear 80 times more likely in the sample, which means that it's not random. And this means that if we can do it, probably a lot of other people have done that before, uh, especially think about uh, advertising companies or, or me, like whatever, some companies that have a purpose of selling something, selling narratives for others. So they might show up, they might, they might show, look how we put your product into the public discourse. So this would be, the, I say, the most harmless <laughs> uh, uh, use of that uh, flaw in, in, in Twitter data. So yeah, we could show that, and we repeated it. And I cannot go into detail here, but it will, this paper hopefully will come out soon. So I will, yeah, uh, we'll be happy to discuss it then. But, let, let me come back before we end. Uh, in times of delusion and the haunting specter of the capabilities of our methods and technology, and when they still resemble a horse whip, 
we need to push for more reflection of data construction, and especially since we are still doing inferred statistics, even though with the most sophisticated network analytics, we are still doing inferred statistics. The need for sampling is not an artifact of a period of information scarcity. It is even more a necessity in times of information abundance. And we can talk in 100 years again about it. Maybe it will have changed. But at the moment, this is how it is. And I think we will have to think about other things, which I cannot go so much into detail. But one that is really important is Twitter, for example, does not allow that uh, researchers store the data and share the data that they got from Twitter, which is a total problem because you cannot replicate the studies. Especially, this is totally crazy given that it's a real-time analytical effort that is giving some kind of quite important longitudinal perspective, or could give a longitudinal perspective on things, on big changes in society. So this is all totally crazy, and this definitely has to change. And the next big thing is that we have to restore, or at least, or maybe we have to gather the trust in computational social science, again, because data trust at the moment looks like really, from politician side, just data no politics, or data are there for depolitization of, of discourses. And what does it mean? The bigger the better. I mean, I think we have to translate this much more easier for, for politicians as well. And we have to think about on what basis we want prediction and forecasting and machine learning in that regard to happen. On, on flawed samples that we have no idea, on blind sampling, is that really how we want to train our machines? Is that what we want uh, to make decisions? And of course, this is all linked to the future of our own scholarship. Do we, how, how will we, responsive, how we will be responsible uh, to that, yeah, to that regard? Yeah. Do we really want to keep on telling, like going on uh, telling the story with this pencil, this this equivalent of the pencil of nature, the social sensors? Are the, are the pencil of the social or something? The social is revealing to us through the uh, agglomeration of data or something like this. I mean, this is totally absurd, but it's really what you can what you can read in, in also political strategy documents. So studying the cooking of data in social media research brings all those issues uh, to our attention. And our insights into the flaws and samples supplied by Twitter confirms this broad concern. Because uh, these whole things, they amplify existing platform and user-centric biases, or I wouldn't say biases, uh, problems, and they co-produce communicative realities. Because you see all these analytics, they feed back into what they are analyzing, and they are co-shaping the world that we are living in. So we have to think about what would be a, social, a responsible social media scholarship do in that regard. And this is my last slide. So we say, or at least we don't know how to do it yet in, in many regards, but we say, first of all, we have to think about how we can, or how we are already engaging with the realities, and how we wish to create, uh, real, or how we uh, wish to create, uh, or engage reflexively with the realities. Uh, uh, so what do we actually want to happen? Yeah? Uh, and we have to answer all these questions. I mean, how big does it need to be? Social sensors of platform logic, real-time social sense making. Is it really necessary to do everything in real time? Is it really working? Especially since the authority regarding knowledge of the social is heavily contested. You know, there is this uh, continuing articles from Savage and Boris about how so the, the social media analytics or that the commercial sociology is kind of taking over uh, 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 of social scholarship. Yeah? So academic research is definitely not on the forefront of these debates anymore, but it should go back there and it should fight more rigorously. So we definitely need another culture of providing info about the methods, and this is where the openness comes in today. Uh, open methods, I mean, it's becoming more and more important. Open data where it's possible, where it's not uh, sensible, but where it's possible. Or at least uh, parts of data should be made open. Data should be made shareable, especially in, in that regard, in Twitter uh, timeline regard. And uh, we should maybe reflect that we are not dealing with biases, because this would just emphasize that there is this perfect world uh, with the end of theory out there. And on the contrary, we should work within and with the limitations of the available data sources and collection mechanisms. I, actually, there are people doing that already. 
there is uh, people using Twitter more like a, a tool for conducting new forms of focus groups, uh, using social media as a group discussion tool and stuff like that. So that you have very good uh, uh, approaches already, but they are still very marginal, and I think they should be made, be made much more visible. And we are also trying now to develop, based on what we have learned, <laughs> we are trying to get out of, get out of this Twitter bubble in a way. Um, and uh, we should be combining them more effectively with other methods that are already out there. So exactly what you are also interested in. Uh, and uh, open methods and open data would clearly improve not only research efficiency, but especially also integrity. And so they would help definitely reflecting the realities that we are enacting with our research. Thank you very much. Thank you.